this was the largest unsolved serial killer case in the history of the United States. Most homicide cases might have upwards of 200 pieces of evidence, but um, in this case, we're looking at about almost 10,000 items of evidence. It's unprecedented. This is the story of America's longest running and most prolific series of murders. For over two decades, the citizens of Seattle quaked under the shadow of the Green River Killer. What you need to know about the Green River Man. A murderer so prolific that by the time he was caught, over 48 women had been murdered, left to rot in the woods of Washington State. Thriving city of Seattle, hub of the tech industry and the coffee capital of the world. But 25 years ago, it was the setting for a series of deadly murders. There was a dark cloud over this community for a long, long time. August 15, 1982, a day young detective Dave Reichardt of King County Police would never forget. This rafter had drifted down the river, so as he's drifting down the river, he sees uh, what he thinks are two mannequins that are placed up against the bank of the river. And it looks like they have a couple of rocks placed on top of them to hold them. As the rafter gets closer, he sees that these are not mannequins. They're human. Of course, they've been there a while, and they're uh, dead. Ah! Well, I was a brand new patrol officer. I'd been on the street about 30 days, and one of the calls I responded to was the girls in the Green River. Officer Sue Peters saw police forensics pull the bodies of Marcia Chapman, Cynthia Hines, and Opal Mills from the riverside. Just being at the riverbank, seeing the victims' bodies in the water, it was, you know, shocking and upsetting. Uh, you know, that someone came to their death in that manner. The killer had both strangled and had sex with all three victims. The police made a connection. A month before, two other women, Wendy Caulfield and Deborah Bonner, had been strangled and dumped on the banks of the Green River. King County Police had a serial killer on their hands, and the list of young women going missing was growing by the day. Detective Reichardt had to move quickly. Very soon, he found a connection between all five murdered women. What we discovered is that, uh, what, for whatever reason, um, th these young girls were uh, leaving home, forced from home, uh, out onto the street. And uh, they became involved in the world of prostitution. Just off the Pacific Highway en route to Seattle Airport lies the notorious SeaTac Strip, still the most lucrative area for prostitution. In the 80s, this was known as the hunting ground of the Green River Killer, and it was where the police began their investigations. Have you heard about uh, a, 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 a guy out here raping and hurting some of the girls? I'm sure there is. The secret lifestyles of the prostitutes and their reluctance to report violence against them to the police made them the perfect victims. Your job is to get in a car quickly and disappear into the night. Can you have something for me? And do what you're paid to do. 
And then, if you're lucky enough, you can come back and do it again more than once that night, make additional money. But if you're not... Where's the money? It's here. And you run into Ridgeway, you end up dead and you don't come back. Many more girls would take this risk and many more would fall victim to the Green River Killer. Get off the street. There's a killer on the loose. You're putting your life in danger. One of the young girls on the street, with confidence, she said, not gonna get me. I'm too smart. I'll be able to tell. I always ask, are you the Green River Killer? Two weeks later, I was picking up her body. Some of the girls that disappeared from the highway, it was hard to actually figure out what day they disappeared or what time. A lot of these witnesses were alcoholics or drug addicts themselves. So to try to get them to remember were they next to Deborah Bonner or Marsha Chapman or Open Mills or any of the, the victims was almost impossible uh, to do. All five of the victims so far had been dumped in or around water. But in September 82, the Green River Killer changed his pattern. He started dumping bodies in urban waste ground instead. Even though this site is some five and a half miles away from the Green River, police do believe that this latest victim is related to the Green River case. Giselle Lavorne's strangled body was discovered close to the SeaTac Strip. She was found in an abandoned lot under the flight path of Seattle Airport. And just like the others, no one had heard her scream. No one had seen her murdered. A few months later, Linda Rule's scattered bones turned up in a Seattle building site. The majority of the remains were discovered by accident. A caretaker at a baseball park, children playing, a couple bikers were out with their dirt bikes. Forensic anthropologist Bill Hagland and his team were given the challenge of identifying the bodies at the new dump sites. That challenge is exaggerated when bodies are dumped at convenient pull-off places where young people like to drink and throw their excess beer cans, where people take their garbage and dump it, or they're cleaning out the garage and just dump it alongside the road. You find bodies dumped in this context, in this environment, of a lot of extraneous material. What's evidence and what's not? There appears to be some garbage uh, in the immediate area, um, possibly on top of the body. It, it's so difficult to tell. It right became now. a real challenge for the crime lab because at one point, then they end up with 10,000 pieces of evidence from this case. And, and just storing that and preserving it and actually packaging it and being able to follow it and track it and know where it is becomes quite a, uh, quite a feat. Time spent sifting through garbage hindered the investigation. With seven girls murdered and more going missing on a daily basis, pressure was mounting on King County Police. This is the corner of 3rd and Cherry in downtown Seattle. On September 12, 1983, 20-year-old Tracy Winston was standing just about where I am right now. That was the last time she was seen. Like many girls working the strip, Tracy Winston had been a difficult, wayward teenager who left home young and was lured into casual prostitution. Tracy was walking back from King County Jail where she'd been arrested for soliciting when she disappeared. Just before leaving, she'd phoned her parents, promising them she would change her life. It was the last time her mother, Murty, heard from her. I didn't know where to turn my grief. I was terrified all the time, terrified of finding that Tracy was gone from us forever, and yet terrified of living with the fact that she was just missing and would never be found. As the months went by, it was feared Tracy was one more victim of the Green River Killer, but her remains would not be found and identified for several years to come. 
You like a refill? Ashtray? I don't smoke. Can I get you anything else? Just the check. Then in May 83, an eighth body, 20 miles away in Maple Valley. Carol Christensen was not a prostitute. She was a, an employee at a local bar in the south end of Seattle. Carol Christensen did not fit the Green River Killer's pattern. Her murder confounded detectives. There were two trout on top of her body. There was a brown paper sack over her head. She had a bottle of wine, and on the back of one of her hands was a small piece of sausage. None of the previous victims had been left in this bizarre way, but the police were suspicious that this was an intentional ruse by the killer to confuse them. They were convinced that Carol was another victim of the Green River Killer for very good reasons. It was obvious that she had been undressed and redressed again. The killer had been having sex with some of the victims after they were dead, and Carol Christensen had been subjected to this. But there was something else, something the police had been careful to conceal. What you need to know about the Green River Man. He left a stone in the victim's vagina, and this was confirmed by an anonymous letter sent by the murderer to Seattle's biggest newspaper. All serial killers have a signature, something unique which identifies their crimes, and the stone was the Green River Killer's very distinctive mark. Leaving the fish in the sausages on Carol Christensen was a one-off, not something he did to any other victim, but by leaving the trademark stone, he confirmed to police that this was one of his crimes. Stone in the vagina. Why? By the end of 1983, another seven more women had been discovered. Those, plus the eight already found, raised the body count to 15. We, we were sad and ripped apart inside because someone else had been killed but at the same time you're hoping okay now is this is the case this is the one that will will solve the whole puzzle we'll find that piece that will tie this all together and we'll be able to stop this and put this guy in jail so far these searchers haven't found anything They'll keep looking, however, for that one elusive piece of evidence that could be the key to solving the case. We were way behind, and by the middle of 1983, I just said, I gotta have help. I need some more detectives. In 1984, the task force was expanded, eventually swelling to a pool of 40 detectives. Matt Haney was among the new recruits. There was this community room that they had transferred into the bullpen, that's what they called it. And it was lined with desks all around the outside edge and then these double rows of desks down the center all back to back and this uh, constant hum of people talking on the phone. You'd be working along, and all of a sudden, one of the sergeants would stand up and say, hey, we just had a um, remains discovered someplace out in the county, um, and just start pointing, you, you, and you, and you, and you, you're all going. And everybody got in the cars, and off we'd go. I'm sorry, this area here is closed. Thank you. That became normal. As everyone came together, those detectives that came in and had no clue about what was going on, it was all brand new, came in with the attitude, which was good, that something was wrong and we're gonna solve this case in six months. Over the next six months, almost two victims a week were being found, sending the new task force into a spin. There were now 26 women dead, 26 unsolved murders. Everyone was looking for the Green River Killer. 
30 members of Explorer Search and Rescue Units spent the day in the rain. They hoped to find clothing, jewelry, or other identification connected to the women on the Green River list. The forensics team recovered thousands of items from the crime scenes, but the real clue lay in what they didn't find. We sift every single piece of dirt, uh, twig, anything that's there, and we never recovered jewelry. So we knew the killer was taking the jewelry. And generally speaking, when a killer takes the jewelry, he's keeping it somewhere. Where was the missing jewelry? If police could locate it, they could find the killer. You that's they catch him, that's what I hope. By now, the case was all over the airwaves. It's pretty scary. <laughs> You know, three of them found by our school in just a short of time. I mean, this guy must be crazy. Everyone was asking who was the Green River Killer. At the task force, the phones were jammed with tips about potential suspects. Oh, there were thousands. I mean, not hundreds, but thousands of people that were tipped to us that, that really needed to be followed up on. Out on the strip, undercover female officers posing as prostitutes hoped they would ensnare the killer. I mean, you can sit out on the highway in a patrol car or as a plainclothes officer 24 hours and, you know, you, get, you have all sorts of characters out there. I mean, how do you pick the one that is the serial killer? But the murders continued. Detectives now had a new fear. All right, ladies, hold it right there. You're both under arrest. What? Prostitution. The killer was a policeman. There'd been a lot of focus that if it wasn't a police officer, then maybe an ex-police officer or someone posing as a police officer. Get in the car right now. I'm waiting for a friend. I don't, I don't care. Get in the car right now. Show me your badge. You're looking at it. Anyone can buy a badge and use that. And unfortunately, anyone can buy a gun. We had tons of officers out there on the street. You just can't charge someone because they're doing all this weird stuff out on the highway or they're circling the girls or they're picking up the girls. That doesn't make the case. We had no physical evidence that was going to connect us to any one suspect at this time. So it was a matter of tracking down these people who were picking up prostitutes and then backtracking with their life to try to connect them to the victims. The Green River Killer had now murdered 26 women. But King County Police were no further forward with their investigation. Tired of reaching dead ends, the task force appealed to psychological profilers for help. What type of man were they looking for? One of the things that we were told is that the person responsible for this may try to inject themselves into the investigation. And, uh, and, and so we did get some uh, people who called, and one person in particular was Melvin Foster. Suspect Melvin Foster looked promising. Working as a taxi driver on the SeaTac strip, he knew many of the victims personally. His job gave him easy access to the girls, who police conjectured were his unsuspecting prey. He uh, actually became um, a prime person of interest for us. Foster called police and offered his help in their investigation because he knew some of the victims. We had a number of conversations with him and uh, searched his house, searched his car. For nearly a month now, undercover officers have been stationed in this area, keeping a 24-hour watch on Melvin Foster. We found uh, photographs in his car of, of uh, young uh, women, young girls, 15, 16 year old girls, partially dressed. Did you kill all those women or what? No, but I wish I did. I wish I did know who did. People said we had tunnel vision when it came to Melvin Foster, but you have to be focused and you have to have uh, a determination to investigate fully someone you think might be responsible for a crime like murder. Police won't say whether Foster is being charged or even if he's being arrested. This summer, Foster said he wasn't worried about either. Scared, no. Fright is for the guilty. But Foster was innocent. Police repeatedly failed to connect him with the murders. King County had wasted valuable time and money while the killer was still on the loose. 
It was a public embarrassment that would hamper the investigation for years to come. If I need to take a detour, I'm going to take the detour. And I'm going to follow that up unless something comes along that tells me that I have to go another direction. Four years would pass before police would find that new direction for their investigation. But at last, a pattern began to emerge, and King County Police had a new focus. Eyewitness accounts kept pointing to the same thing. The murderer drove a pickup truck. One of the, the I think, the most important leads we had involving the pickup truck was Maria Malvar. Marie Malvar was a young Filipino prostitute who was missing. She was last seen by her pimp boyfriend, Bobby Woods, getting into a pickup truck on the SeaTac Strip. He was actually watching Marie work and saw her uh, appear to make a date with a John in a pickup truck. And he even later related to me that he never followed her on dates. I mean, it just wasn't his, but for whatever reason, he followed her this time. And they drive northbound on Pacific Highway South. He, according to his statement, said she just didn't look comfortable, she didn't look right. Then the pickup vanished into Military Road, and Bobby Woods lost Marie. Bobby drives around, doesn't see her, drives back to the location where she was picked up and just waits. Marie never comes back. Bobby Woods made a statement to police about the disappearance of his girlfriend in a pickup truck. But thousands of pieces of information were coming into the Green River Killer Task Force. And the significance of this information was overlooked at the time. What you need to know about the Green River Man. Many more young women would die before King County Police would realize how close they had come to the killer. By 1987, the number of bodies recovered by King County Police had risen to a staggering 36. You like a refill? All victims of the Green River Killer. Five years after the murderous rampage started, the police were no nearer to finding the truth. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. We had no physical evidence to connect uh, any one person to, to any of these cases. But things were about to take a turn. Eyewitness accounts pointed to a new suspect, a man who drove a pickup truck. Once we knew that a pickup truck was most likely the suspect vehicle in the case, we collected a list of every pickup truck that was owned at that time. Detective Haney trawled through old police reports. He looked into every single investigation which involved pickup trucks in a bid to search for clues. His work paid off when he came across a case which stopped him in his tracks. A report written four years before detailed the possible abduction of a prostitute by a man in a pickup truck. Haney tracked down eyewitness Bobby Woods, the pimp boyfriend of missing prostitute Marie Malvar. Bobby told Haney how he remembered looking for the pickup that took Marie away, just off the SeaTac Strip at Military Road. He thought he'd found it. Well, it didn't take, literally, it was just minutes, and he sees the pickup. Worried about Marie, Bobby Woods had called the police. 472 County arriving. So they go up and knock on the door. How you doing, sir? I've got a couple questions for you. Step yeah. outside, please. Do you know who Maria Malvar is? Is she here? Have you seen her? Person, um, is that your truck in the driveway, sir? Yes. So there was no probable cause to even suspect that this was the right house, the right truck, the right guy. What was your name, sir? Gary Ridgway. Gary. R I D G W A Y. Gary Ridgway had been arrested by police in 1982 for soliciting. He was a suspect for the Green River killings but had been crossed off the list after he passed a lie detector test. My you, girlfriend is in that house. Okay, your girlfriend's not in this house. Yes. Okay. And they knew Bobby Woods. They knew his reputation. They knew that he was a pimp, and they just kind of quit there.
The report on Marie Malvar had been filed away and forgotten, but Marie was still missing, so Haney looked again. How about if I throw in the teddy bear and for 15? Who was Gary Ridgway? Okay? Haney discovered he was a divorcee with a son from his first marriage and now lived with his girlfriend, Judith. Ridgway was a long-term worker at the Canworth plant where he spray-painted trucks. Haney asked to see Ridgway's timesheets to check out where he'd been when 36 women were murdered. He had all these different missing time location dates for different victims. And they were in the morning, they were in the afternoon, they were on weekends, workdays, evenings, and yet Gary's schedule always fit to make him available. At last, Haney was onto something. He wanted to move quickly. Next, he needed a search warrant, but to get one, he had to have more proof. There was one person that knew Ridgway intimately, his ex-wife, Marcia. Haney won her trust, and Marcia confided in him about her relationship with Gary. He liked outdoor sex, and one time he really, really scared her. She was walking around the back of the car, and suddenly he appeared behind her in the dark and started choking her from behind. And after he chokes her, then he apologizes, and she says, you know, frightened and indignant and everything else, and he says, oh, well, that, that wasn't me, and uh, that didn't really happen. And It was just one of these bizarre incidents that again, would fit with somebody with a bizarre behavior. And there was more. She showed Haney the places Ridgway liked to have sex. She took us all the way out I-90, took us right to one of the locations exactly where one of the victims was recovered. She took us to these different garbage dump sites that were really, really, I mean, really close to where different victims had been found. Uh, took us up to the airport, but definitely took us down to the Green River. At last, Haney was granted a warrant to search Ridgway's house and workplace. The police hoped they would find jewelry stolen from the murdered girls. There had always been a belief by many that once we found the killer, we would find evidence of trinkets or, you know, something. But the police's high hopes came crashing down. I was hoping, and I'm sure all the detectives were hoping, that we would recover some items linking him to the victims, whether it be identification or trace evidence. Uh, those things were important for us, and that's what we were there looking for. And uh, it turned up negative. Haney's bosses were nervous. They couldn't risk another scandal like Melvin Foster, the innocent man they'd hounded earlier in their investigation. I was getting direction from those above me to now let's not be rude to this person let's not be too much of a, a, a position to him let's get his property back to him as soon as possible and i'm on the other side going we we should never give back the property you know we need to keep it until we know absolutely positively sure that we have to give it back because we've exhausted every possible evidentiary process time had run out for haney but not before he'd taken a crucial hair and saliva sample from ridgeway you know, we collected hundreds of items, so they still need to be processed. We don't know what's going to be found or not found. There, it was no time to quit. The warrant failed to produce any clinching evidence against Ridgeway. After eight years of searching, the police still had 36 unsolved murders and no definite suspect. Body finds became less and less frequent, and many believed the murderer had stopped, was in prison, or was dead. Over time, the Green River Killer Task Force was scaled down to almost nothing. I just had spent the last eight years of my life obsessed with catching this guy and uh, traveled all over the country, chasing down every lead I could chase down, staying up late at night and not being able to sleep.
The police investigation into the Green River Killer had come to a dead end. With body finds now very infrequent, the task force was scaled down. The Green River Killer became a thing of the past. Evidence from the murders of more than 30 women was filed away, sealed up in boxes inside a police warehouse. A decade would pass before they'd be reopened. In this facility, we do have, in some cases, the hair mass that was left right where this, this skull may have been. Fingernails. You're talking about the clothing that may have been uh, on the victims when they were murdered and their remains were found. Now this here is our freezer. This is where we keep the fish and the meat that was found with Carol Christensen's body back in 1983. DNA extracts. We had many families contact us and we contacted them and would get the uh, DNA samples from siblings and paternal and maternal parents. In 1999, scientific breakthroughs in DNA gave King County Police the chance they'd been waiting for. Old evidence could be retested for DNA, and unidentified victims finally had a chance of being named. Sixteen years after her disappearance, the remains of Tracy Winston were identified. Murty Winston finally knew what had happened to her daughter. Her remains were actually found in May of 1986. And from 1986 until 1999, her remains were in the medical examiner's office in Seattle. But we didn't know that because the remains were not in, in total. But the advances in DNA didn't just mean that the police could now identify victims. It also gave them the chance to identify the murderer. The Green River Killer had made a fatal mistake which gave the police the scientific evidence they desperately needed. The stones he'd inserted into the victim's vaginas had preserved his sperm inside them. This meant swabs taken at the time held the killer's DNA. Police scientist Jean Johnston was under pressure. She needed to extract the killer's DNA, but the evidence was old and fragile. The cotton material was pretty much all gone, but you could tell that there was still um, biological material clinging to even the sticks. All Jean needed was one of the murderer's sperm to be present, but with such a tiny sample, the chances were slim. We put it in a little plastic tube and add some of our liquid chemicals to it and actually um, extracts off the cellular material. And then we can make a, a smear, a microscopic smear, and look at that under the microscope. But was there sufficient genetic material for Gene to make an identification? After nearly two decades of chasing the Green River Killer, the police finally had the chance of securing a DNA sample which could identify the murderer. Police scientist Jean Johnston knew how important this evidence would be. I remember being able to look at the slide and, and there's, there weren't a lot of spermatozoa on there, but there certainly were um, several. And I knew if there were several, there was a chance, even if the evidence was decades old, that I, that I might be able to get a DNA typing profile. Two other samples taken from victims in the river had also been tested by Jean's colleague. She'd matched exactly the DNA profile she'd extracted to a saliva swab taken from one of the police's prime suspects. Jean and her colleague watched as the results came through. She knew that it matched it, so she was just jumping around in that room. She was just so excited. Um, and I started to share her excitement because I could see that it was going to be another matching profile. Matt Haney was working for another police department when he got a call to come back to King County and hear the news. They sat me down and they said, um, it's scary. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they said, uh, the DNA evidence came back and it's definitely Gary. And we want you to come join. It's a secret task force. You can't tell anybody. And of course, my mind is racing and you have this elation of... Finally, you know, we're going to be able to do something. 
On November 30, 2001, King County Police waited to arrest Gary Ridgway as he left his place of work. The doors pop open and the detectives jump out and say, Gary Ridgway? He says, yes. They tell him, you're under arrest for the murder of four women connected to the Green River case. And he doesn't say anything except, okay. And he gets into the van, they handcuff him, pat him down, he gets into the van and they drive off. And the next thing I hear is, over the radio is, uh, one in custody. Over. But Gary Ridgway claimed he was innocent and Ridgway's lawyers were building up a strong case Mark Prothero was part of the defense team. Good morning. Please be seated. The fact that his DNA was found in uh, a prostitute that he'd had sex with was not proof that he killed that prostitute. It was proof that he'd had sex with them in proximity to the time they were killed, and certainly suspicious, but it wasn't arguably proof uh, that he'd been the actual murderer. The DNA evidence they hoped would catch Ridgway was not enough. The police needed more for a conviction. They needed to link Ridgway directly with the murders. And their best hope to do this was with the help of microscopy, the analysis of minute particles through a microscope. The police reached out to Skip Palahniuk and his team of experts who have a worldwide reputation in this field. We've been called in to work on a number of uh... Uh, I guess what you call high-profile cases over the uh, over the years. Skip was asked to look again at items of clothing taken from the victims, and more importantly, ligature used to strangle them. Would he be able to find particles so tiny that they were missed first time around? And would he be able to match them with particles found on Ridgeway's clothing? All of a sudden, what do we start finding in this uh, dust, this fine dust, is little particles of paint, but not just any paint, spherical particles of spray paint. Particles which were maybe sometimes 80 micrometers, 100 micrometers, 50 micrometers in diameter. Why do all these women have in this fine dust from their clothing microscopic spheres of spray paint? They weren't members of the Greater Seattle Area's Women's Graffiti and Spray Paint Club. They had no good reason for having spray paint on their clothing, particularly multiple colors. When we go further and we then analyze this paint to determine its chemical composition, what do we find? But that it's a type of paint that has recently been introduced by the DuPont company called Imran. Skip traced the particles of Imran paint to its manufacturer, DuPont, who listed the companies they supplied. The biggest customer was Kenworth, the plant where for 30 years Gary Ridgway spray-painted trucks. You like a refill? The links to Ridgway were indisputable now for seven of the murders. Time for Prothero and the defense team to change tack. So that then began our discussion of exploring Plan B, which is if you did this, tell us everything you can in the hopes of, of, of seeing if the prosecutor will drop the death penalty. Ridgway asked to talk to Prothero in secret. I remember it vividly on April 11th of 2003 when he told us in his conversation, I killed them all. He would have sex in the rear entry position, and when he climaxed, he would um, think of something to get the young woman to lift her head up, at which point he would wrap his arm around their neck and choke them to death. He described it being a very traumatic, guilt-ridden experience at first and with an expectation that he'd be caught. What you need to know about. However, as he was not caught, he began to enjoy what he was doing. After Ridgway's secret confession, his lawyers approached the state prosecutor looking for a plea bargain. 
In exchange for information on nearly 50 murders, would they spare Ridgeway from the death penalty? There wasn't ever any doubt in my mind ever that what I wanted to see happen was all the cases that we could get solved should be solved so that the victims' families could know what happened to their daughters. In exchange for his life, Ridgeway underwent six months of interrogation, broken up only by field trips to the murder sites looking for bodies. Just keep on going straight, then you're going to be taking a left up here. He wanted out of his small room, and he enjoyed the field trips, and, you know, we wanted information from him. Yeah, this is where, as I think... Gary would just point to an area and then we would leave and go back and the people they referred to as the diggers and whackers would go out and get all the brush and, and, and sift through the dirt looking for remains. Among the four new victims recovered was Marie Malvar, who fought hard for her life and lost. Ridgeway had dumped Marie on a steep ravine miles from the others to punish her for the deep scratches she'd left in his arm. He didn't look like a killer. Some of these victims he dated multiple times before he killed them. And what had Ridgway done with the evidence that Haney tried so hard to find? He would actually would leave it sitting around his workplace and then watch different fellow workers, ladies, pick it up and then actually wear it. And then he would have his little secret that would remind him of one of the victims that he'd killed. Ridgway also admitted Carol Christensen, the young waitress that he murdered, was a deliberate attempt to throw police off his trail when they came to his door looking for Marie Malvar. On November 5, 2003, Ridgway was brought to the county courthouse to plead guilty to the murder of 48 women. And Mr. Ridgway, is it your desire to plead guilty to the 48 charges of aggravated murder in the first degree because you believe that you are guilty of each of those offenses? Yes. I thought for a moment, it, 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 this can't be the guy. I will now sign the statement of defendant upon plea of guilty. And Mr. Ridgway, you may be seated. You know, look at him. He's, you know, small in stature and, you know, drove a truck with his son's toys in it. And, but then for a moment, I wanted to kill him. I'm not proud of myself for that, but I wanted to kill him. I thought, how could you take something so dear away from us? How could you do that? New bodies are still being found. It's thought the death toll could rise to around a staggering 70 victims, making Ridgway America's most ferocious killer. Gary Ridgway is now kept in an 8 by 8 foot cell for 23 hours a day. He will be there for the rest of his life.